Hey everybody, uh, this is Tom Peterson giving you a talk to continue our discussions of model evaluation. And essentially what I want to do today is to show you some work in progress. It's not published yet, um, probably not in final form yet, but I think the ideas are mature enough that, that we can start to uh, play with them and use them. And essentially what we're doing is we're setting out to provide you with a um, an alternative set of model evaluation approaches, and specifically model evaluation approaches that are not based on predictions. So we're gonna use our discussions from the last few weeks about model uncertainty, and we're gonna develop some metrics of model quality. This project is a collaboration between the, the uh, Jardim Botanico de uh, Rio de Janeiro and uh, members of my lab and, and Jorge Soberon's lab um, at the University of Kansas. Um, so the members of the team are uh, Marinez Siqueira, a longtime colleague um, from Brazil. Um, and postdocs in her lab, Sara Mortara and Andrea Sanchez Tapia. And then doctoral student in my lab, uh, Marlon Cobos, and postdoc with Jorge Soberon, Luis Osorio. So uh, it's kind of embarrassing for me to be in this group because everybody's way more competent than I am, but they seem to put up with me and they're letting me give this talk. Um, so let's talk about evaluating models. Um, basically every model evaluation technique used to date is based on predictions. Um, and essentially all of them are derived from the confusion matrix. The only real exception to this statement would be a couple of uh, methods that are under development and Rob provided you with a paper, Rob Anderson provided you with a paper last week uh, that presented one of these. But these are papers that are, uh, or me methods that are based on comparing with, with no models. And so uh, you may look at those as well. But by and large, essentially all model evaluation so far has been based on how well your model predicts. Um, and as we've discussed last week, prediction-based evaluations are subject to really significant complications, um, such as unavailability of independent data sets, shared biases between um, training and testing data, spatial autocorrelation, temporal autocorrelation, et cetera. And so with my colleagues in this group, um, we're seek seeking to create an alternative and complementary approach to model evaluation. And the important thing is that it doesn't depend on predictive success. So imagine we have a spectrum of suitability and it goes from low to high. And our model may make various um, types of predictions. You know, we can imagine a very bimodal or very binary prediction, like in this red curve. And that's basically saying that uh, my prediction is mostly yes or no and not much in the middle. Or maybe like this green curve, which is mostly in the middle and with a few areas of high suitability and a few areas of low suitability. Or the prediction may be more uniform, like in this, this gray curve. But suffice it to say that different algorithms for different species on different landscapes may make very different types of, uh, let's say, distributions of suitability values. Well, what we're setting out to do is add a second um, axis to this plot and hopefully learn something from that. So we're gonna plot uncertainty on the y-axis against prediction of suitability on the x-axis. And I want you to think about different sectors of this rectangle that these two axes define. Down here in the lower right, 
we're having predictions of high suitability with low uncertainty. And so we have a, a pretty clear prediction of suitability. Over here, we have the reverse. We have a pretty clear prediction of unsuitability. And notice that both of these are near the extremes of the x-axis and at the lower end of the y-axis. But what about the rest of this space? Well, we certainly have these two areas, which are in the middle as far as prediction, which is to say it's not predicted either high or low suitability, but uh, the uncertainty may be low or high. Uh, this area is probably the least useful part of this whole plot because it is both unclear as to suitability and uncertainty is high. And then we have these other two sectors which are predicted to be suitable or unsuitable, but those predictions are very variable, they're very, very uncertain. So we have this kind of crowded plot, and the question is what to do with this. Well, here's, here's our thinking so far, and I'm gonna show you our thinking via a worked example. Uh, my Brazilian colleagues had access to a, a very large data set on, on um, epiphyte plant species along the um, Atlantic Ocean uh, sector, and especially in the Atlantic Forest region of Brazil. And you can see we have lots of, um, lots of data available to us. Um, and so this seemed like a very good um, universe in which to explore these methods. 32 species, um, and essentially what we're going to do is we're going to take, for each of those species, we're going to develop a best possible model using all the records, and then we're going to randomly throw away half or 80% or 90% of those records. And what we're really trying to do is to make bad models because we want to pick out good versus bad models. So the particular example doesn't really matter. Uh, the, the, the important thing is that we have things that we can be pretty sure are bad models and things that we can pre, be pretty sure are better models and see how our, our idea of a methodology responds to that. So we're going to take our 32 species. Uh, we're going to take those four sample size treatments. And that's going to create 128 um, sets of models to develop. But we thought to make things even more complicated, so I'll show you that in a moment. Um, we're using data from World Clim, uh, World Clim 2, that is, at 2.5 minute resolution. Sorry, that's a typo. Um, and we, we collapsed the environmental variables into fewer dimensions using a principal components analysis. We've used Modeler and KUENM to uh, calibrate models. You've already heard talks about both of those approaches, so I'm not gonna go into details about that. Rather, I think you will uh, see KUENM soon, but I'm, again, I'm not gonna go into great detail about that. And then here's how we develop those bivariate plots that I was talking about earlier. Each of the model outputs gives a prediction of suitability for each pixel across G, some, some region of interest. And as we discussed in the uncertainty section, we can calculate uncertainty metrics for every pixel on the map also. And that might be calculated as, as a range of values, or a trimmed range, like an interquartile range, a standard deviation, et cetera. And so every single pixel in the study area has a value of suitability and a value of uncertainty. And these values can be turned into essentially data uh, or, or tabular data by means of a, a couple of GIS tricks 
Um, for example, you could convert the raster to an uh, ASCII text table format in kind of an XYZ uh, format where X is longitude, Y is latitude, and Z is the value of suitability or uncertainty. Or you could use the um, grid coring or extract value to point function and extract the values of both suitability and uncertainty to a set of points across the region. Those points could be random or they could be uniform. Suffice it to say there, that there are lots of ways to get this information out in usable form. And then you can just create bivariate plots uh, between suitability on the x-axis and uncertainty on the y-axis. So we wanted to create some metrics that we could explore. And what we've been doing so far is to uh, split our distribution of points into, I guess it would be terciles, uh, but essentially one third of the distribution above, one third of the distribution below, and one third of the distribution in the middle for both uh, axes, for both uncertainty and suitability. And so now remember Q1 and Q2 on this, those are the uh, sectors that we said were very interesting because they're dramatic predictions of suitability, either yes or no, and there's their predictions with low uncertainty. And then Q3 and Q4 are kind of the very uncertain predictions of high and low suitability. And so we've developed two metrics that just refer to, uh, to this diagram. The first is, um, we can call it total, but essentially we're relating these highly uh, certain and highly definite predictions of presence or absence to the total number of, of points in this plot, might be the total number of pixels in your study area. Or there's one that's essentially ignoring all of these points in gray, where we say, well, what proportion of the um, high suitability or say high suitability or low suitability points are in this rather than high and low uncertainty? And there are other variants. We could do Q1 out of all of these points. The point is we we're going to explore a couple of metrics that tell us how much of our map falls into these two sectors? Well, here are results for six different, um, six, five different algorithms and one algorithm represented with uh, two different uh, species. And all I want you to see is that we get very, very different results. We have this kind of frown shaped relationship and this kind of smile-shaped relationship. Here's a kind of a fatter frown. Here is an ascending relationship. Okay, we've looked at a lot of these plots and they, they do vary quite a bit. But what I want you to notice is that some of these plots barely have any red points, which are in those very interesting sectors. So like, look at the GLM plot. There is no pixel that is predicted as highly suitable with low uncertainty. Or in SVM, the pixels predicted with the highest suitability, like above 0.5, are all with also the highest uncertainty. Whereas others, like Maxent here or Random Forest here, are doing a good job of making some clear and definite predictions. So then we wanted to ask some questions about uh, whether these, these model evaluation metrics are, um, are relating in intelligent, meaningful ways to things that we already know. Um, for example, we know that BioClim is not a terribly powerful um, algorithm. 
And indeed, we're seeing our evaluation metric as having some of its lowest values um, for, for BioClim applications, okay, in both of these. Um, and then notice our sample size spectrum goes from very low to very high. And so for at least well-behaved algorithms, we would expect the lowest category to be very poor quality and then higher sample sizes to get better. So the GLM result or the, the random forest result are exemplary of that. Now there's some disturbing stuff in here. For example, SVM seems to get worse with more data. Um, that may be some sort of overfitting problem. I don't know, although overfitting is a, is a prediction-based term. Um, but my point is simply that SVM is behaving differently. Um, but in general, what you can see is that this lowest sample size category has a higher variation than the other categories, and in almost all cases um, is, is performing less well at getting um, predictions that are um, of highly or not suitable with low uncertainty. So all I can say at this point is this is very interesting and I throw this out here for you so that you're thinking that not all model evaluation needs to be based on predictions. Okay, so this is a study that'll just give you a few more examples and visualizations of these, these, uh, these ideas, these plots. Um, and this is a study that I did with Abdallah Sami uh, late in his doctoral studies here at KU. Uh, and essentially what we were setting out to do was to summarize the, the geographic potential for transmission of disease uh, caused by phyloviruses, so Ebola viruses and, Mar and Marburg viruses. Um, and what, what I want you to see is that in each case we've presented the prediction and the associated uncertainty. And I want you to just see this by eye that there are places like this that are predicted as highly suitable, but notice the blue color, low uncertainty. And so those are really good predictions that those areas are, are um, great places for, sub, for transmission of this species of, of Ebola. Now there are other, other areas that are predicted with high certainty, sorry, with high, as being of high suitability, but with high cert, uncertainty. And those areas would come out as interesting, but less clear as far as uh, whether they're suitable for this disease. Now in contrast, we could look at Bundibugyo Ebola virus, and what I want you to see is that the areas predicted as being suitable are predicted with high uncertainty. And so if we look at these two species and three others uh, in this bivariate space of uncertainty versus suitability, we can see that that, that uh, Sudan Ebola virus prediction is one that's going to have a lot of uh, pixels in this lower right and lower left sector, and very few up here in the highly uncertain sectors. And in contrast, Bundibugyo has essentially no pixels down in the lower right sector, which would be low uncertainty predictions of high suitability. And so this is just to give you more visualizations for more species, but suffice it to say that our thinking is that models that have lots of points in these sectors are going to be more useful, and models that, that don't are gonna be less useful. Okay, so just to sum up the idea of model evaluation without predictions. Um, None of this presentation is to suggest that prediction-based model evaluations are not useful. Certainly they are. Predictions are the motivation for many NM studies, 
And predictive ability is a great test of how general and not overfit models can be. But predictions also have their complications and that can detract from their outcomes or from the confidence that we put in the predictions. And so we think that there's a, a relationship between suitability and uncertainty that speaks importantly about model quality and utility. And as you can see from what I've shown you and not shown you, these methods are still under development. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, I hope that, that you will have some good questions for me or for the, the, the instructor team on Friday. And I hope this at least awakens some good discussion and some, some insightful uh, uh, commentary about the, the possibility of these, of these methods.